see what's happening. Okay. Um, let's get right to it. Get a few things covered today. I want to finish up in these rocks. We talked about this idea that we can um, really look at igneous rocks from two standpoints. Those that get extruded, that lava that comes out on the surface, making essentially the rocks that are the, the aponitic or the fine-grained rocks, rhyolite and the site of the salt. Or we can look at rocks that don't make it to the surface, the magma that gets trapped down below, cools off slowly, becomes coarse-grained material, and we looked at those igneous rocks as the intrusive or plutonic igneous rocks. And those were the, the granites, the diorites, and the gabbros. So, you know, it, it seems a little overwhelming when we go through all of this, but if you just break it down into blocks, it becomes uh, a little more manageable for you. And I think you kind of start seeing the relationships then between these various rocks, and it kind of makes sense. They kind of just click into one place or the other. But we were talking about this idea of um, the uh, craters versus, versus calderas when we, when we finished up last time. And the idea that a crater was simply the vent where the gas had blown out during, during the making of the volcano. So this would be a very a gas rich uh, environment, uh, probably more of a uh, viscous type of lava, so something more silicious or cool, and cinder cones were pretty typical of that. Um, so we end up with this constructional crater, whereas calderas were really a destructive type of, type of thing. They were more associated with composite cones, where the cone collapses down into the evacuated magma chamber from down below. And rather than being constructional, it's destruction. And you can kind of see that here with Crater Lake. The, uh, essentially the big cone that used to be here, uh, in this case they call it Mount Nagama, and when it collapsed into the, the uh, magma chamber, uh, it left a big hole on the surface and eventually filled with water and formed uh, Crater Lake, which is kind of a misnomer really, it should be called there a lake. And you can see how over time the magma chamber is refilled, it's still active, and some of that magma has found its way to the surface, starting to build a new composite cone. And that shows up here as Wizard Island in Crater Lake today. So it's a beautiful area, gorgeous area, really a neat place to go visit. Take some money with you. Uh, it's not a cheap place, but um, you can actually see kind of the next steps of where this volcano is going. And if we look at other places like Krakatoa, which is erupting today down on Hawaii, or Yellowstone, which is actually three of these giant collapsed calderas. Yellowstone Park is just three of these all kind of right next to each other, cutting across each other. Um, uh, Krakatoa, which is a big Indonesian volcano, and Santorini in the Mediterranean. These are all um, caldera type of situations. Well, why does it collapse again? Well, basically the, the magma is leaving this chamber, coming up to the surface and building up this big cone. So there's an empty hole in this. Yeah, there's okay. an empty hole underneath. And, and eventually that cone gets so heavy that the weight just collapses down into the void below. It just can't support it. Okay. All right. So here's Mount Mazama. This is the cone that used to be sitting there where, where we now have the Caldera Crater Lake. And uh, this is the area of the U.S. that is basically covered by the ash from that explosion of that uh, uh, final eruption of Mount Mazama. And you can see the uh, the uh, the cauldron down below here, and it's blowing ash and debris into the atmosphere, pyroclastic ash. 
And we're going through this process now of Bowen's reaction series down there, where the temperature's cooling a little bit. The upper part of Bowen's reaction series, the olivine and those types of things, are settling out of the melt. They're the first to form, and they're the densest, so they're forming and they're settling to the bottom of the magma chamber. So that leaves the magma up above deficient in this iron, magnesium, olivine part of Bowen's reaction series. That's kind of settled out of the system. So as the eruption goes on, it's sucking out this, this magma off the top of the chamber. It's essentially kind of silica rich. And that silica is kind of whitish in color. So all of this ash that's getting deposited early on is silica rich ash from the top of the magma chamber. Well, as the process continues and all that silica-rich magma is being used up, eventually it gets down to the point where all this magma that formed uh, with the, the uh, top of Bowen's reaction series, all that iron-magnesium-rich stuff is settled at the bottom, finally that starts to get used up and that spews out this volcanic ash in the final stages. And that's all this darker ash up here. So ash from the same volcano, but you can see here where it was using up the silica-rich ash from the top of the cauldron, and here where it finally started using up the bottom of the cauldron with the iron-magnesium-rich stuff that it set below. So it's kind of, kind of neat the way, but we saw in the cauldron the light over the dark kind of becomes reversed on the surface with the dark over the light. The Bones Reaction Series in operation right there. Now this is a neat package. If you look at it, this is all volcanic ash. Think in terms of time. This was a volcanic eruption. It probably lasted a few months at most. Geologically, that's essentially instantaneous. Compared to billions of years of geology, a few months of time is like batting your eyelashes, right? So here I've got this double colored ash spread all over this wide area here. And talk about a marker bed now, a key marker bed, that whenever I see this formation, I know just exactly where I am, time-wise and rock-wise, in the section. I can tie it right back to this volcanic event. So even though I can only maybe see sections of the rock here and there, if this is exposed in that section, I know how to put those sections together. That's pretty cool. Okay, what happens if this magma at depth can't make it to the surface? It just isn't hot enough to find all the cracks and melt its way along and get to the surface and become a volcano. Instead, it's trapped underground and it just slowly cools off down there. Now, instead of having extrusive fine grain rocks, we're going to have intrusive or plutonic coarse grained rocks. And the bodies that these rocks are going to form, we call plutons. Plutonic rocks, plutons, right? Pluto, the god of the underworld. So now, we're going to see that we have coarse grained rocks because it cooled off slowly. Couple of terms that are real standard terms that you need to use. We're going to use them all the time. I've got this giant volcanic magma body down here. It's cooling off. It cools off over hundreds of thousands of years. It originally started about seven kilometers below the surface of the Earth. That's kind of about the minimum depth that these guys form in. Seven kilometers deep. And over the years and years and years, 
that seven kilometers of overlying rock is eroded away. And eventually this rock now that formed seven kilometers below the surface is now exposed at the surface. All the overlying material is gone. That's a lot of erosion, isn't it? And that's going to take a lot of time. This kind of goes back to this seven or 6,000 year old earth. We're not going to do that in 6,000 years. But we know it takes that kind of a depth for these rocks to form. And we know for coarse grained rocks, they don't form on the surface of the earth. They've got to cool off slowly. If, when that rock gets exposed at the surface, and it is exposed over an area of larger than 100 square kilometers, but bigger than that, when you look at it on the surface, <coughs> then we call that body a bath of it. Okay? If it's less than 100 square kilometers, we call it a stock. Same darn thing, it just hasn't had enough of the covering rock removed to expose it at the surface for 100 square kilometers. So stock can become a baffle just by definition as it's exposed and exhumed. Or maybe it never was big enough. We can expose the whole thing and it's still not 100 square kilometers. It'll always be the stock. But we use those terms simply to give you a real quick definition of what the size of the body is. Okay, it's the same thing, just different sides. This way, I don't have to say every time, it's a big, coarse grain, magmatic body greater than 100 square kilometers. I can just say it's baffled. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so terminology <coughs> kind of is, is a shorthand here. Now, I've got this hot magma. I'm intruding it into this surrounding rock. And as you might guess, a couple things are going to happen. That rock that's surrounding this hot magma, some of that's going to melt. It's pretty hot, isn't it? So if my magma is hotter than 